not just in the midst of it, but I believe we're on the forefront of some things that God's breaking forth. Amen? So good to be in revival. Glory to God. Well, it's great to be back, everybody. But I'll tell you what, there's so much going on here that this is the place to be. Right smack in the center of what he has for us. And it's an exciting time. Um, let me know when you go live and I'll, I'm live. Okay. Uh, just welcome everybody to Grace Fellowship of Georgetown and happy Memorial Day. Um, we just speak blessings on all the veterans and, and we're grateful for those that gave the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, today as we were worshiping, um, I, I had a vision and what I began to see was I saw, um, an area of ground and places of it looked like it was concrete. And then there were some like cracks in it. And in some of the cracks, there were like little um, seedlings or things sprouting up through it. And then I saw um, much more pushing up from under an area of ground. And what I heard the Lord say is that this is a groundbreaking season. Continue to water the word and walk and watch as I break forth on all sides even in seemingly impossible ways. He says, don't look at time. Don't look at delays. Don't look at past difficulties. Don't look at past experiences. Pay no attention to things of the past that would try to speak into your future. For they belong squarely in the past. The Lord says, rejoice, for I am breaking forth on all sides. I surely will bring to pass all that I have spoken through my prophets, through the word, through my promises. The Lord says, I will surely do it. And this is a season to watch as the ground yields to the power of the seed breaking forth and breaking through in this season of groundbreaking, says the Lord. I believe we've started a season we've been believing for for years. You ready for the word this morning? Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to set a direction. Although we're going to start one direction, we're going to get on a rabbit trail for the rest of the service, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, are you there? Verse number one. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Faith is our ability to receive from an unseen realm. It's the provision God gave us to receive out of the kingdom of heaven and bring it to the world today, right? In, the, in, the, in this potential of faith, we can see every problem in our life resolved. Every challenge solved. Every need met. Now, in this verse, he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I'm telling you, when you really make a faith connection, when you really build faith in your life, it has substance. You know you have faith. You're not hoping you, you have something. You know you have it. But it says it's the evidence of things not seen. Actually, a better translation of that word evidence is conviction. You're convinced there's an unseen realm. You're convinced that unseen realm can provide what you're believing for. Amen. You really believe you're convinced you can live out of another kingdom. Yes. Not visible with natural eyes. Amen. Now he goes on and he says. Verse two. For by it the elders obtained a good report. By what? By faith. Through faith we understand that the worlds, the ages, that word worlds, there should be ages. We're framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God, through faith, created this entire universe and put in place all of the ages through the words he spoke. And then he goes into this. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to read through this today. But he says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. He starts talking about all these people, what they did by faith. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Moses. 
Well, he goes on to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all the way through all these great leaders in the Old Testament. And he says, what they did, they all did by faith. Making it clear that God's looking for people that will become experts, masters at using the principles of the kingdom, including faith. Amen. Now, I've written on the board for the sake of time. We've been talking about this some lately. And this is two steps. I'll just call it to a resolution. One and two. Whenever there's a need you have from God, there's two possible paths you can receive of it. The one path that's the easiest is called the gifts. The Bible talks in 1 Corinthians 12 that there's a gift of healing. Actually, gifts of healings. And there's workings of miracles, right? Uh, there's giftings that regardless of whether you have faith or not, God will meet your need. Amen. When you see many of the great healing evangelists, even in this church, people will come up for healing sometimes that aren't really believing. They're just hoping. Or maybe somebody made them come up there. And it's amazing how God has mercy on new believers. On people that are new to learning about the kingdom of heaven. They'll come up here and you say, what do you want? Well, I'm hoping God will heal me. And you pray and boop, God heals them. Had nothing to do with their faith. It was a free gift. Amen. So Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin, Jack Coe, A. E. Allen, all these guys with these big tents. People would show up, some in faith and some not. Yet multitudes would be healed. Amen. By the spiritual giftings. And praise God for giftings. There's even a gifting of faith. I've had it come on me uh, more than once where... You're going to pray for somebody and all of a sudden you know they're going to get it. Yes. You just know that you know it's, it's about to happen. Yes. And it wasn't because you'd worked your faith up to that level or built to that level. It's because God dropped faith on you supernaturally. Yes. It's one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. And it supersedes individual faith. Yes. It's God just saying, you need this, I'm just going to give it to you. Mm-hmm. But it's amazing, once you get matured in the body, once you get a little older... How God expects you to grow up and use your faith. There were things early on maybe God would give to you as a gift, but later you got to use your faith for. And you try to go get it as a gift. And God say, no, 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 no. Get in the word. Speak the word. Believe me for this. Amen. Not that the gift can't come on you later, can't produce for you later, but God does expect us to grow up beyond beyond baby state. And the gifts are mostly for people that have not yet developed enough to use their own faith. Amen. The second passage, and see, this is the thing. If you went to a Benny Hinn conference, and maybe you went there with some major infirmity, some major problem, you don't know if you're going to be called up or not. How many have ever been to a Benny Hinn crusade? What does he do? He starts calling people out. I don't believe all that stuff. Well, I've been in the middle of it. It's real. And uh, he'll call people out, word of knowledge, and say, God says you've been suffering with this, and he's healing you right now. Boom, they'll be healed. Free gifts. But you might go, there There may be 25,000 people in attendance. You don't know if you're going to be called out. In fact, let's say he calls out 50 people, and there's 25, or, you know, uh, 25,000. What is that? About one in 500 chance you're going to get called out. That's not very certain. And God wants us to graduate beyond just chasing healing revivalists. To be able to believe by faith for his promises where we're at. And the second route is the route of faith. Here's the gift route. Here's the faith route. We've been talking about this, and I'm just going to briefly cover it again this morning. That if you're really going to stand on faith for anything God has, there's several steps involved. It's more just believing, well, I believe the word of God is true, so I receive it. It's more than that. you got to build your faith. You have to develop it. Uh, if you've ever watched the guys that bodybuild, not me, don't get mistaken. 
they'll work on their what it called leg day one day and triceps and neck and whatever else you know and uh they're building themselves up in each area they want to build up if you're going to walk by faith there's areas you got to focus on somebody posted a picture the other day of Sylvester Stallone and was it Arnold Schwarzenegger somebody else I don't know what it was supposed to mean, but it showed Sylvester Sloan they'd photoshopped. He had like chicken legs. <laughs> and somebody said he missed leg day. <laughs> you want to you wanna develop properly. There's certain things you got to focus on. And to live by faith, to receive of God consistently, you got to first believe, step one, that faith really works. That you can build your faith and it really will produce. you got to believe Hebrews chapter 11 is real. Do you follow me? you got to believe that God gave you promises. And if you believe the promises, it will produce for you. See, here's the thing. This is a hope path. This, if you'll do it properly, is a guaranteed path. Because faith never fails. Amen. And if you learn to do it, you can always get your answer. And I'm one, I like a guaranteed answer. I'm not big into gambling. I, I like to know the odds are in my favor. And when they're 100% in my favor, count me in. It's no longer a gamble. And faith is not a gamble. It's a guaranteed path. So you've got to believe that faith really will produce. Step one. Step two, you've got to believe the specific promise you want manifested in your life is yours. So if it's healing, you've got to believe promises or verses that deal with healing. Until it's so in you, it becomes substance and you know you have it. Amen. And it's impossible to explain faith until you've had faith. What do you mean you got it? It's like substance. You know that you know what's yours. Here's an example of true faith. How many here believe if you died right today, you would be going to heaven? Anybody here? Well, how do you know that's true? Yeah, here's what happened. You've heard that all of your Christian walk. Over and over and over again. Amen. That if you believe, you'll be saved. Right? Put your faith in the cross, you're going to heaven. You know, and if I came to you and I said, let me, let me pick on somebody. Lynn, if I came to you and I said, I don't believe if you died today, you'd go to heaven. Right. You'd laugh. <laughs> Why? Because that promise has become substance inside of you. Yes. You know that you have it. You're not just hoping, you know it's yours. Yes. And you can have that same type of faith in any promise of God if you just build it into yourself. Yes. Through meditating the word over and over again. It starts to solidify inside of you. And you know it's yours. And even when six symptoms hit you, you'll go, No, devil, Mr. Devil, wrong address. That doesn't belong to me. Amen. Those aren't my symptoms. I don't know how many times in the past little over a year, I've had my throat start to burn a little bit or hurt. Or my nose start to run. Just a little. And the devil always says right away, You got COVID! And I'll say, no, devil, wrong address. And the symptoms all go. Immediately, they go. Why? Because faith has risen to a point, sickness can't stick to you. But you have to, you have to believe certain promises or specific promises to receive it by faith. Amen. Then you must know your righteousness. Now, that's what we've been teaching on in here. And we'll be back on it probably next week. But you've got to know you've been made a new creation in Christ and condemnation doesn't belong to you anymore. Because the devil will always tell you that you're not worthy of receiving by faith. You didn't pray enough. You didn't meditate enough. You didn't, you know, you didn't speak enough. Or here's the mistakes you've made in the past 62 years or whatever. And it reminds you how you're, uh, try to remind you that you're a failure. And you've got to know, no, through the cross, you've been made a new creation. And you can walk boldly into the throne of grace and say, God, I believe I receive without condemnation. 
Because as long as condemnation can visit you and you, can't, you don't have the ability to reject it, then it will cause your faith to be ineffective. In fact, I've put multiplication signs on all of these, if you remember. And if you remember your algebra or your mathematics, anything multiplied times zero is zero. So if any one of these is non-existent, you don't believe faith works, or you don't believe a specific promise, you don't know your righteousness, any of those go to zero, you won't receive. Now, the neat thing is it doesn't have to be perfect. You can have 80% here and 80% here and 80% here, and they'll multiply together. You'll still receive something. Or it just may take longer to get it. Do you follow me? But you've got to work your faith in those areas. As well, you've got to know your authority through Christ. That you've been given the authority to speak the word of God. And every devil in hell must bow to that word. Creation itself must align with the words you speak. Right? And then the fifth one is you must follow the spiritual principles of the word. In other words, you're believing for finances. If you've not sown a seed, it won't produce. If you're believing for healing, but you're not speaking it, that violates the spiritual principle. You won't receive it. You've got to sow the seed. You've got to honor your father and your mother. The Bible says faith works by love. You better be endeavoring to walk in love. You can't be mean-spirited and think it's going to produce for you. And, of course, James said, a lot of people, I believe it was James, could have been John, are believing for promises of God. But he said, you want to spit it on your own lusts. And because you do, you won't receive anything. See, these are spiritual principles. And so they got to be implemented. Now, all of these first four steps here all deal with faith. You must, you must believe faith works. You must believe specific promises. You must believe in your authority and believe in your righteousness. Those are all faith-related. The fifth one is primarily works-related. you got to speak something. You have to stand. You have to love. You follow so whatever God instructs you on, whatever the Word says. you got to do it. Those are works-related. And what did James say? Faith without works is dead. Being alone. You can have all of this, but if you're not doing something to activate it, it won't produce. You can mix all the ingredients for, for bread together, but until you put in the yeast, you get crackers. And bread, yeah. Crackers, eh. <laughs> and these are steps that are mandatory. To live by faith, to walk by faith. And it runs contrary to so many people's normal thinking. I just don't know if I can agree with all of that. Well, I'm not teaching anything not in the Word. That's right. And I've come to the realization, I'm limited in what I can do of my own ability. Yes. But God says through faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Yes. Now again, I'm a calculating type person. I'm limited versus faith is unlimited. Let's see, which shall I choose? <laughs> I'm going to do what's necessary to live, to learn to live by faith. Yes. Amen. And it's a process. You'll, you'll fall some, but because you know faith works, you'll get back up and do it again. I remember when I first set my heart to live in divine health. This would have been, I think, 1990, 91. And I was determined I was going to live by faith. And I was winning some battles. But then I got hit with the flu. And I don't think I've ever had the flu that bad in my life. I was sick than a dog like five days. And I wouldn't go to the doctor, wouldn't go get any treatments, not that they could do much of anything. But I remember it got so bad. My, I don't remember what my temperature had, 104, something like 103, 104. And I remember falling back on the bed. I'm walking the floor. I mean, I'm healed. I'm healed for days. Getting sicker. And I fell back on the bed and the whole room started spinning. And I jumped and said, no, I'm healed. And it broke. But then it was probably six months or a year later, I got the flu again. It lasted like two days. Then hit me again later, it lasted maybe a day. It went, went on just for a few years. 
that it got where it lasted an hour. And then I went 25 years without getting the flu. Glory to God. It was worth the battles. I had to do some work. I had to apply myself, but it was worth winning those battles. And I don't believe I ever have to be sick again. Amen. Amen. But it's not, it's not going to come to you just on a platter. You got to fight for it. Amen. Now, regarding these spiritual principles, turn with me to Proverbs 18. I want to take a little bit of a side trip here. And I refer to this a lot. We go here a lot. But it's so good to look at the word with your eyes. To remind your eyes what the print says. Proverbs 18 verse 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. Now what a statement. But here God's speaking about a spiritual law. That what you speak will fill your life. And with the increase of his lips, shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now again, this runs contrary to human thinking. Our trained understanding. Amen. We think death and life is in the power of the devil. The power of sickness. The power of somebody attacking us. But here the word says, it's in the power of your tongue. And that, you know, how many besides me were raised up hearing sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie of the devil. Words can kill you. Especially the ones you speak. We've, we've. Fallen for some lie that what we speak has no major impact or importance. When in fact, it's the determinant factor for the direction of our lives. And a person that's going to be victorious in the kingdom of heaven must learn to control what comes out of their mouth. Amen. And I want to talk about what we speak this morning just for... I'm going to do a specific application. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to kill out a, a religious cow. Can I do that? Go for it. Will you guys let me just butcher a religious cow this morning, meaning something we believed in the past? In fact, before you go to Ephesians, go to Ma- uh, Mark chapter 7. Let's go there. Mark chapter 7. And verse number 6, Jesus answered and said unto them, Well hath he say us, for Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 7, Howbeit in vain do they worship for me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, Jesus addressed some of these commandments that religion had changed. You follow me? He said, the worst is honor your father and mother is the first commandment with a promise. But he said, you say that, but then you say also, well, I've dedicated my goods to the, to the temple, and therefore I can't support my mother and my father. And he says, you're making the word of God powerless by that. That you're teaching man's doctrines instead of God's word. And Jesus came to kill religious cows. I mean, he came just to flip over the tables in the temple and say, you're doing it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. And part of my assignment in the church is to tell the church, you've got some things wrong. We've got some things wrong. We're trying to be nice people versus anointed people. We're trying to build big churches versus glory-filled churches. And God wants us to put things in the right order, and the Word should be first place. Amen. 
he goes on and he says, in verse number 7, How be it in vain do they, oh, I'm sorry, verse number 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. See, when you replace the word of God with a tradition, you neutralize the power of the word. Why? Because you're doing a placebo. See, if the, if the preachers tell you, all you're going to do is come to church, you're going to heaven, they just gave you a placebo. You're not going to be able to access divine healing through that or, or, or financial blessing or whatever God wants you. There's no verse that says if you just go to church, God will bless everything in your, in your household. Therefore, you make the word of God a none effect. And I'm, I, I search the scriptures trying to eradicate tradition from my life. Because we've all got them in there. And I want to talk about one this morning. How long have I been going, Charles? Man. And I got four pages of notes. Ephesians. We'll see how far we get. Ephesians chapter 4, 29. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And I repented for this Friday night. I'll repent for it again. We showed a movie uh, Friday night to quite a few people that I hadn't seen in 20 years, and I forgot the, how much profanity was in it. It wasn't just be riffed with it or filled with it, but there were some things said that just are not considered godly. And so again, I repent for that. It, I should have previewed it. And once I heard a, a few words, I should have said, no, we're not doing that. I apologize for that. But I also want to explain something uh, that sometimes we get offended by things that are said we call profanity that God never said was a sin. Here it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Some translations say foul language. But that word corrupt means rotten. That which is spoiled. That which is unfit to eat. And we've come to interpret that as cussing. You shouldn't cuss. That really, is, I don't believe, applies that, that verse at all. It's not talking about cussing. You follow me? It's talking about that which is rotten. Well, cussing is rotten. Listen, I'm not defending cussing at all. Not at all. I hope, I hope to have it totally out of my life, to never say another foul word, because I believe it doesn't represent Christ appropriately. Do you follow me? But I want to look at what God really says about the words we speak. See, we define cussing to speak words that are frowned upon. And most of them are slang. Do you follow me? Instead of but, B-U-T-T, he said that in church. Backside, we may say something else. And one was cussing, one one. It's the same thing. It was the same thing. You just said it with a different word. Yes. <laughs> you know, the Bible's full of this word that we can't speak publicly. It's H-E double hockey sticks. <laughs> but we'll say heck. And heck is just slang for Hades. Do you find that, that because we replaced it with a slang word, all of a sudden you're sinning. You're profane. You're cussing because you said a word that in our age right now is inappropriate. I heard that. Like you're going to get yours busted, right? I mean, I'm going to go further with this. But I can't find a single scripture in the word that says you're going to be judged for your slang. Do you find, and again, I'm not defending profanity. I'm trying to get you not to freak out over it. Because I have, 
I have people, you know, I'm, I live in the world. I go to motorcycle gatherings. I go to witness to people. I got family. And it's amazing how many people will say blank. And they'll go, I'm sorry, I forgot you were a pastor. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, Jesus, I hope I can recover. Yeah. <laughs> I heard a bad word. And it was slang. Again, not defending, trying to put it in proper light. We've elevated cussing to like one of the top ten thou shall nots. And it's not even in the word. Do you follow me on this? Can I take this further? Yes. Well, we can say the word dung. It's the same thing. We can say female dog. What I'm getting is what we're saying are, are improper words. See, we're not naming something specifically that's bad. We're just using a slang word that's frowned about. Or we're replacing a frowned upon word with slang. Because heck is slang. How about this one? Dang. is a slang word. Right? Drat. Slang words. For the other one. And I'm not recommending you go around saying D or G D or anything, you follow me. But when you say dang, you're saying the same thing. You're saying it in a fashion that the public is not frowned upon. And we're letting people's perception of what a bad word is frame what's acceptable or frame what's a sin. And and the being upset over cussing has become a very strong tradition in Christianity. When it, in God's eyes, it may not be all that serious, other than it reflects bad on the church. Here's one. If you go to England, the word bloody is the equivalent to their F word, our F word. That is a frowned upon word. So now we see location determines what's a cuss word. There is no set of banned words in Scripture. Amen. Yet, we've been so trained or ingrained with this rejection of profanity. And again, I'm not defending it. I don't want it in my life. But we've been so entrained about it that somehow... Oh my, are they even saved? And I'm not sure, biblically, if it's that serious. Do you follow me? Not desirable. But there's a whole lot of mean-spirited, covetous, gossiping, backbiting, jealous Christians that would never cuss. And which you think... Which do you think God's really upset with? The biker that never learned to clean up his language? But's living for God? Or the Christian been saved for 40 years and still is not forgiving people? There's a, there's a perspective we've got, we've got to have in these things. You're not going to die or go to hell. I'm sorry, Hades. Because you said or heard a forbidden word. Amen. Now it's not saying, Oh, he said that word. Mark his name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. God's not tracking your, your, your individual words. Amen. Actually, cussing itself is a slang term. What's it slang for? Cursing. The actual term is curse words. We just shortened it to cuss words. Because see, people, people couldn't call, spell. You know, five-letter word it had to be four-letter. I don't know what it is. It's curse words. Now, let me talk about curse words. Cursing means to condemn. Or to speak the opposite of the blessing upon. Many times cursing would be 
to want to send somebody to Hades. Amen? Cursing is to speak, follow me on this, opposite the word of God yes. over someone else or yourself. So, <laughs> if someone says the word poop, <laughs> nothing was ever even condemned. Or if you said the slang term for poop. But poop itself is a slang term, isn't it? That would be slang to the second power. <laughs> Nothing was condemned. You were just expressing, emotionally expressing momentary frustration with the situation when you said the wrong word. Yes. Amen. <laughs> We redefine genuine cursing as a set of actually harmless, fluctuating words. Wow. I mean, they're always changing. There's things we say today that was, that's cussing that wasn't when I was a kid, and I'm sure vice versa. And most are unaware what true cussing or cursing is. Look at James chapter 3. Now, if this is rubbing you the wrong way, just let it die. Just knock that cow on the head. <laughs> James chapter 3, have you got it? Let's go to verse number 8. In, in this chapter, he's talking about the power of the tongue. It says, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Your tongue can kill you. Amen. Therewith, bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse, there's curse. Curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not so to be. Does the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, be olives, olive berries? Either of vine figs, so can no fountain yield both salt water and, and fresh. Here James is trying to let the reader know that we've got to control what comes out of our mouth. Because if you are controlling it in some areas but not others, it still is defiled. Here's an example I'll use. Well, here's an example I used to get tickled at. They would have a smoking section in a restaurant, but it's all the same air conditioning system. And who wants to swim in a swimming pool with a urinating into the pool? Here's a line in the water. It's all mixing, amen. And here we're hearing, you got to make sure you have fresh water coming out of your mouth at all times. But he's not talking about rejected words. He's talking about inappropriate speech or cursing speech. You may tell you what true curse words are. You ready for this? I just wish they would drop dead. That's a curse word. Or drink poison. You follow me? Or fail in whatever they're doing. They're losers. Screw-ups. They're stupid. Those are curse words. You're using your tongue to speak words of curse, the opposite of blessing, over people made in the similitude of God. And James said, you shouldn't do that. Yet how many people are speaking about other people, often negatively, but would almost faint if they heard a profane word? Which one do you think God really puts the greatest weight in? See, we've got to understand these things and get our minds focused on what God's priorities are. Again, I'm not advocating for, for, for cussing. But better to cuss than to curse. If you get my meaning. And one has an impact and one doesn't. 
as far as actual release of the power of God. Well, they can just go to Hades. Or GD with anything following. And there's an example of profanity, what we call profanity, that is a cursing. Because you're, you're declaring something goes to the underworld. Something is cursed of God, really what that word means. But by itself, it really has no meaning, but you have to apply it to something. GD this car. GD this job. GD these people I work with. You follow me? Now you're using your tongue to speak the curse. And so it'd be good to get GD out of your vocabulary. Amen. How about this? They're crazy. How, 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 how can I say? Easily do we say that? They're crazy for that. I don't believe it's all that. Here's an example I want to give you. Have you ever been to a vending machine? And, you know, they used to have the ones where you pull the knob. And whatever comes up, comes up. And now they have the ones where you type in E5. And let's say you want, you want, you know, you want a Butterfinger bar. And it's on E5. But you're talking to somebody, you turn and you hit F6. Which is Cheetos. What are you going to get? Cheetos. You're going to get Cheetos. You hit the wrong button. And these spiritual principles are set laws. They don't go by your intention. That's right. Well, I wanted a Butterfinger. Give me a Butterfinger. No, you hit F6. You got Cheetos. Suck it up, cupcake. cupcake. Eat the Cheetos, you follow me? That's not what I meant. See, these words we speak, we've been so programmed to think that they really don't matter. It's all but what you intended and not what you said. But the worst is what you say. Jesus said, command them out to be thrown in the sea. But you don't say, well, I meant for it to go. You didn't say it. And when you start speaking curse over things, you may not have meant somebody to go crazy, but you pulled F6. And it takes a revelation that these words really matter because they carry authority. Can I give you a hint on something? How many want to have authority to cast out devils? I do. To command mountains to be removed? To command the natural to line up with your desires? Whatever you need? Did you know God cannot grant most Christians any more authority? Because what it were, what, how they would misuse it speaking the wrong things. Would you like to see an example of that in the Word? I've gone here many times, but go to, go to 2 Kings. How about this? They're going to die. What do you mean by that? If I ever had a serious illness... Infirmity or condition, I would never post it publicly. In fact, if I've had challenges in the past, only a handful of people ever find out about it. I find people of faith. I would go to Apostle Callan or Pastor Jim or Pastor Sherry or, or Pastor Rebecca, Pastor, I'd go to them that I know understand the power of words. Because as soon as you post something online, and somebody reads you have Kilimanjaro disease, whatever that would be, their first reaction is, they're going to die. And you put out there, would you please pray for me? And they're going, oh, Father, please, if it be thy will, heal this person. But if not, I think they're going to die. And everybody that says, you hear they have such and such, they're going to die. Because you're so programmed with natural expectation. They look at your symptoms and think, this means you're going to die. But you're looking for people to pray for you. Find people who speak the word. Not the curse. 
So, because, because as soon as you say they're going to die, you just spoke the curse over somebody. So God can't give you much more authority because your inability to control the words you have now. Do you remember the story of Elijah and Elisha? And Elisha followed Elijah everywhere, wanting that double portion anointing. And finally, it's Elijah, Elijah's time to go up. He's caught up in a whirlwind. Elisha gets his mantle. He's got the double portion. He goes to the Jordan. He takes that man like a whip, and he goes, shh, 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 where is the God of Elijah? And the Jordan parts, and he walks across. I want that. Come on to me now. Amen. He's got this new double portion. He's actually, uh, in 2 Kings, done his first miracle. He, he purifies a, a spring. There's a, there's a spring that's causing people to get sick. And he just put some salt in it, and it heals, the, it heals the water. Now he's done his first big miracle. But look at verse number 23. 2 Kings chapter 2, I'm sorry. I thought you'd pick up on that in the spirit. I meant to say it. Now, he's just done his first miracle. This is, and he went up from thence unto Bethel. Say Bethel. That's the house of God. Bethel is house. El is God. It means the house of God. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children, say little children, out of the city and mocked him. And said unto him, go up thou bald head, go up thou bald head. They're mocking him as if he should do what Elijah did. Get caught up, right? Let me see what you, let me see you do a miracle like he did. So they're making fun of him. Just did his first miracle. And now kids are coming out to mock him. All oh, the tortures of being in ministry. Kids will make fun of you. And he turned back. He turned around. Where was he going? He was going to the house of God, but he did an about face. And it says, and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tore 40 and two children of them. He cursed him in the name of the Lord. He lost his temper, used his authority improperly, and 42 children died. Do you think that was the will of God? Do you think it was the will of Elisha? He meant something else. But he lost his temper. And the authority and anointing he carried cost 42 children their lives. Do you see this? And we can't afford to carry these double portion anointings if we can't control the curses that might come out of our mouth. That's how important this is. You want authority? There's, an, there's, a, there's, there's a mandatory, necessary, how can I say, skill you've got to develop that nothing comes out of your mouth except blessing. Yes. Yeah, unless God's telling you to curse something. Amen. And look what it says. And he went forth thence to Mount Carmel. Where was he heading? Bethel. It changed the course of his ministry. He had to change directions because he lost control of his tongue. And from thence returned to Samaria. You go into the house of God, you end up in Samaria. Because you discovered you didn't have control of your words like you need to. In these end times, God's raising up people that don't curse. Not afraid of cussing, but they refuse to curse. Let's get on with this. A few years ago, my brother underneath me, my youngest brother already passed away two years ago, but a few years ago, uh, my next brother got cancer. Uh, they removed one of his kidneys. He had a, a, a tumor in it the size of an orange, they said, and swelled up huge. They told him, go home and make your arrangements. 
you're going to basically you're going to die. And I'd call him to pray with him. He's not even at the time I wouldn't himself as a Christian. Be very borderline. And I say, how are you doing? And he had a he had a saying he would always say every time, no matter who asked him, he would say, I'm in my prime. That's all he would say. He would never say, I'm dying. He never said how bad things were, never talk about how he was in pain. He would say, I'm in my prime. And totally recovered. A miracle. But he would not speak the curse. He would only speak the blessing. And uh, he said it so much this last Christmas. Did you guys ever see the movie Tombstone? And Val Kilmer, we sick. Wyatt says, how are you doing? He goes, Wyatt, I'm in my prom. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm in my prime. Yeah. And that's when my brother got it. So for Christmas, they got him a tombstone T-shirt. On the front says, I'm in my prime. <laughs> because that saying alone, I'm convinced, saved his life. So now my mother's fighting some cancer. And that's what she's saying. It's interesting. She went in for to, for a check Tuesday at her hip. She got lung cancer. Uh, she's been attacked with it, but she also her hip was hitting really hurting really bad. Well, they checked and said there's cancer in your hip. So they went and they looked and uh, they said we need to do surgery the next day. Your hip is so deteriorated. We need to do surgery. When they went, it turns out the cancer already eat through her, her femur. It was broken too. She was walking around on a broken, disconnected femur. In a lot of pain. They fixed it all up on Wednesday. Put in a new... She had an artificial hip already, so put in a new piece of that. Rebuilt the femur and everything. And said, you should go home by Friday night or Saturday. Thursday, she was going up and down steps. And they said, you are one tough woman. She's 86. You're one tough woman. They sent her home. You don't need to be here. But she's saying, I'm in my prime. And so we don't speak she's going to die. She'll live and declare the works of the Lord, right? So we're talking about cursing other people. But I tell you what we tend to be best at is self-cursing. Cursing ourselves. Now I'm going to say some things and probably every toe in here is going to get stepped on. Is that okay? I mean, if we're going to deal with a religious cow, should we not let the toes get stepped on? How do you curse yourself? I could just die. Remember we said, we saw in Proverbs 18, death and life in the power of the tongue? Yes. Death is the natural state of the world system. And it's the natural speech that will come out of our mouth. We never say, I could just live. I'm living to see you. We say, I'm dying to see you. The enemy has this program to speak death all through our lives. It's self-cursing. Well, that's getting too far out there. I understand it is. But I understand this. The kingdom of heaven doesn't work like the natural. And if you come into the kingdom with natural thinking, you won't let it be renewed. You'll stay functioning in the natural. I'm sick and tired of fill in the blank. I'm sick and tired. How about, I'm full of life and energized. I'm healthy and full of, full of strength. And then we say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. When they just compounded it. Curse squared. It's funny, but these are things we do. Now in here, if you're willing... We have a, a corrective vocabulary system. If you're not willing, we won't do it. We'll try it, and if you react inappropriately, we'll quit. But we correct each other's speech. Pastor Rebecca will tell you, she says something in, wrong, I'll correct it in a second. I'm just tired of this. No, you're energized in this. Yes, I'm energized in it. <laughs> How would you like to be around me with that all the time? Amen. I have to be careful with my wife. I got to find my openings. Amen. 
She knows where I sleep. <laughs> but if you're open to it, we'll help you work on your language. But if you say, I know that, I know that, well, help yourself. <laughs> We're not here to make your life miserable or try to, you know, to pound anything in your head. We're here to help, here to help each other, right? Yes. But if you're open to it, you should have people helping you correct your language. I'm open. If I say something wrong, I'm open to it. There was one case. I meditated on it for a long time. And finally, I know I did and a few others helped correct Apostle Callan on a confession. Way back. He would always talk about how he was like the target for every mosquito in the area. Yeah. He was a mosquito magnet. I'm just a mosquito magnet. If there's one around, it'll bite me. And he's taught us how to control our words. I'm going, no, 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 no. And I don't want to correct the apostle. I don't want to correct. Because they weren't biting me. But he was confessing. And so what happens? He got bit. I was telling some of the guys the other day, we had another building in town that we sold here, New Year's Eve. And I was working on the roof. There's a group of us working on a sign up there. And I had to nail some nails on the top of the roof. And uh, so I'm up there on a ladder, got my hammer. I'm bang, bang, bang. And underneath where I was hammering was a red wasp nest, the paper wasp. Here they come. And, of course, my first thought is, get me out of here. And the Spirit of God says, if you'll take authority over them, they can't sting you. I said, okay, God. In Jesus' name, I take authority of these wasps. They cannot sting me. I go back to hammer, and one lands on my arm. Lifts the arches of the back. The stinger's coming out a quarter inch and cannot reach my arm. Wow. And I finished hammering wasps all around, not a single sting. Couldn't tell. That's the power of our words. Yes. But if you're talking about how every time there's a beat around, it finds you. Maybe you prophesied that in that manifestation. How about this one? Nothing works right for me. Anything can go wrong, will go wrong. Murphy's Law, we speak that. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous for us to do. And then we make inner vows. I'm going to do a teaching. I've been talking about it for a few years. I'm going to do a teaching on inner vows sometime. We say things like, I will never forgive. You just vowed a curse within your life. Because the Bible commands us to forgive. But you don't know what they did to me. I know what he did for me. How about this? I can never get over. Nobody likes me. I'm dying to see you. I'm going to lose my mind. They drive me crazy. Now, when you end up at Eastern, we'll know why. Well, I didn't mean it. You, pull, you pressed F6. What can I say? Yeah, Cheetos. And here's one. Here's one. And probably everybody here has done it. My pet peeve is you just authorize something in the natural to get you upset. You're confessing in your life. Every time that happens, you're going to have a meltdown. I don't want any peas, and I certainly don't want to make a pet out of them. <laughs> And if you have them, the things that set you off, don't speak it. Speak peace. Speak peace to the storm. Amen. So my question is, what are we going to do now? Freak out over a set of banned words, cuss words, that aren't even in the Bible? I mean, there's some words in the Bible that today you can't say. Amen. Read Song of Solomon. But apparently you could say it one time. But now God frowns upon what he put in the word. Or are we going to speak only blessing? 
Well, listen. Let me touch on one more. And we may finish. I've got a whole other page of notes. It's whether I feel led to keep going on this direction or not next week. Here's one of the major curse words you can speak over yourself. Curse phrases. You want to hear it? I can't. Because the word says through faith and us you'll be impossible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Now you can say, I can't lose my temper. You follow me? You know, uh, I can't hate anybody. I can't not think of God. But don't say, I can't sleep. I can't eat. Do you follow me? I can't get my healing. Whatever. Don't speak that. What I'm trying to do is show you how traditions define cuss words. But God's more concerned about curse words. Again, not defending cuss words. I think we should endeavor to be free of profanity, but not have meltdowns when we hear it. Because you're in the world, not of the world. Amen? And I have standards. If I watch a movie... If it's, got, if it's got nudity, it's off. And if it starts having a whole bunch of profanity, I cut it off. You follow me? And if it's blood and guts, cut it off. And I don't watch anything that's a horror movie. I'm not going to be programmed to accept fear. But if I'm exposed to something... My armor's stronger than that. Yes. Yes. And I'm not going to, you know, freak out over it yeah. Yeah. or judge anybody because of it. Some of the most loving people I've known in the past who would never speak a little word against anybody still said cuss words. And some of the most clean speech people I've ever met were some of those critical and judgmental people I've ever known. And I think we have it Sometimes out of focus, what's important to God. Yes. Did you get anything out of this? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. I want to ask you this morning.